Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about the history and the growth of the wine industry in the United States. My guest today is Randy Kimner. Randy is the owner and founder of The Wine Country, a wine retail store in Signal Hill, California. Welcome, Randy, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. It's good to be here. Well, you know, Randy, the United States didn't always have a great reputation for wine. In fact, wine itself didn't have a, a very good reputation in the United States, and we didn't really start to see wine take off in the way that it has in the last 50 years until about 50 years ago. So why did America have this um, less than savory reputation for wine? I think there were a lot of factors. Uh, for one thing, there aren't very many growing regions in the United States. Uh, California, of course, is the dominant one. Uh, there was uh, uh, failed efforts to make uh, wine in places like Virginia. Uh, there, was, there was a New York uh, wine scene going on. But, uh, but uh, then there was this thing called Prohibition, which, uh, which ruined all winemaking uh, between 1919 and 1933. And there were, a, because there was a, quite a wine industry going in California and it, and it stopped it cold in its tracks. Okay, well, you know, today wine is associated with uh, gourmet dining, it's, it's associated with high taste yeah. and uh, the elite drink wine and so forth. How did that happen? Who was responsible for making that transition happen in terms of wine appreciation, which again started around in the 1970s into the 1980s? Well, there always was uh, a small niche market for elite wines. Uh, usually among the wealthy, and uh, and uh, of course uh, 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 people who would vacation in Europe would discover wine. Backpackers would discover uh, uh, wine. Certainly, anybody that read Hemingway knew all about wine. Uh, so there was always this little curiosity, but something happened very profound in the mid '70s that it actually exploded by the mid 80s. And that was the baby boom generation uh, discovered fine wine as uh, a symbol of prestige, of upward mobility, and uh, found that very, very appealing. Well, you know, in, in the Mediterranean countries and in the Middle East along the Mediterranean, they've always had an appreciation for wine. It's, it's just part of the lifestyle. It goes with dinner time and it's always involved with uh, religious ceremonies and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what did they know about wine in the Mediterranean area that we had to learn later in the 1970s? Well, first of all, uh, uh, viticulture actually uh, developed in Greece, uh, where not only the rich people of the day, the, the kings and the rulers, could afford uh, to send their servants up into the wild forests, but they, they established viticulture, which made uh, wine available to the masses, and, and between the Greeks and the Romans, they spread it everywhere. But remember that the Mediterranean uh, is, a, is in that small little belt of, of uh, grape growing, um, well, the grapes love uh, growing there, and, uh, and it became uh, uh, intertwined with the foods of the region. It, it, it was f food. It was a way of preserving grapes uh, by fermenting uh, grape juice, and then you could drink it all year long. So they had the opportunity to, to harvest the grapes and then process the grapes, ferment them, and so on, and it just became a normal staple of dining. So speaking of Mediterranean climates, we have one here in California. I think you mentioned that already, and, but, and the growing of of grapes, uh, what, what are the ideal conditions for growing the grapes that we make wine out of? Well, it's, it's, they call it the temperate zone for, for, um, for wines. It's basically a Mediterranean climate and, and maybe pushing it, if you, if you think of France, for example, uh, the area below Lyon is, uh, is where Provence is 
the area above Lyon, you're into Burgundy, and it's more continental climate, and uh, uh, and you can go up to just about the the little tip of Germany, the southeast corner of Germany. Beyond that, it's too cold and too wet uh, to grow uh, commercial uh, vines that can make uh, wine. But certainly in the Mediterranean, uh, you have enough sunshine that wine grows uh, very freely. And, and uh, to your other point is, is that in California, we have a very similar climate. Uh, wine grapes do very well here. So we have the coolness of the air, uh, generally because of the Pacific breezes coming in. Um, we have a drier climate, it's not always wet. And if you go up, certainly up in the north, in the Sonoma area or Napa Valley and places like that, you get the fog mm -hmm. coming in. And so mm -hmm. it seems that uh, grapes like the fog overnight. Yeah, the, um, uh, actually fine wine really likes cool climates. And um, in warm climates, uh, here in California anyway, we can irrigate and make up for a lot of heat and a lot of uh, dry, um, uh, dry climates. The problem that we get when, with, um, with a lot of heat is that we don't want our grapes to turn into raisins and get that raisiny taste. We still want a fine wine taste the kind of taste that you get in great regions like Burgundy and Bordeaux uh, and, and in Tuscany, but you don't want the pruny stuff that goes from being too hot. So fog is a great way of tempering uh, those hot summer temperatures. You know, also in California, there's been not just a growth of tasting rooms, wine tasting rooms, but also olive oil tasting rooms. So uh, given that uh, we're in a Mediterranean climate, is it uh, not a coincidence then that uh, olives grow uh, in, a, in the similar kind of climate as grapes? Um, it's, it's not a coincidence because um, in the Mediterranean, when you think of not only the south of France, but also Spain, Italy, uh, Croatia, Greece, and the Middle, uh, and the Middle East, all in the Mediterranean areas, uh, they talk about the fig, the olive, and the grape uh, in soils that are too poor to grow just about anything else. Uh, those three things uh, are really the building blocks of their, uh, of their uh, culinary lives and their, um, and their uh, livelihoods. Well, you know, as we talk about California, and if one drives up the 101 freeway or highway from Ventura all the way up to the Monterey Bay, the growth in the vineyards and the tasting rooms has just been phenomenal over the past several yeah. decades. And this is really noticeable in the areas closest to the tourist destinations, lots of tasting rooms and wine tours and so forth, and throw in some olive oil tasting rooms as well. So what accounted for this explosion, if you will, of vineyards in that uh, central coast area of California, and why did it really seem to kick into high gear in just the last 10 or 15 years? Well, it, it, has been, it, is, it hasn't been just the last 15 years. It's, it's been a, a growing since the mid-70s. Um, the oldest commercial vineyard in, in Santa Barbara was planted in 1964. So compared to, compared to Europe, this is, this is, you know, baby steps. This is recent history. So um, the vineyards, uh, these entrepreneur vineyard uh, 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 owners and winemakers in the 70s uh, we're really uh, pioneering that area, but it took a couple of generations before they could figure out, okay, Cabernet does not do well here, Syrah does. Um, let's, let's move uh, our Cabernet and Sauvignon Blanc over to Happy Canyon in the east, and in the west near Lompoc, uh, we'll plant Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay. Um, you know, this sometimes takes uh, generations to figure out because it, it's a long, long uh, investment uh, to do. All right, well, 
When we talk about wine in California, you have different growing regions. Um, you do have Sonoma, you have uh, Napa Valley, and you have even north of that up into Healdsburg. And then again, the Central Valley, or Central mm -hmm. Coast rather, uh, the Central Coast that I just mentioned. So what are the differences in those growing regions if we're talking about specific kinds of wines? What, what grows best in Napa or Sonoma as opposed to what might grow best here in the Central Coast? Well, what grows best uh, is, a, is also guided by what is successful, what is commercially successful. And uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is the king of red wine grapes. And uh, there's no disputing that the number one region in California uh, or in the entire country for Cabernet Sauvignon is Napa Valley. That's not to say there aren't very fine wines that are produced in Sonoma from Cabernet uh, or some very good ones in Santa Barbara County now uh, or even uh, in Paso Robles. But Napa Valley is where the, the, the cult wines, the, the big wines uh, are uh, we tend to look at Sonoma, which is cooler, being um, really good for uh, Pinot Noir and for Chardonnay, and for um, wines that we don't think about too often, like Gewürztraminer, and, uh, and there's still a lot of old vine Zinfandels that are there. So, uh, uh, down in uh, Santa Barbara, it depends on where you are. If you're closer to Lompoc, it's very cold and foggy. <clears throat> if you're in Ballard Canyon, uh, inland in San Inez Valley, uh, you can uh, have a lot of success with uh, what they call the Rhone varieties, which are um, uh, Grenache and Syrah and Morved, and they do grow some uh, uh, white Rhone varieties that they've ha been having a, a lot of success with. I'm going to throw a, a difficult question to you and only give you about a minute before the break here. So, okay. California wine versus French wine. Who grows the best wine overall? Uh, I, have to, I have to say best for what? <laughs> because California uh, makes wonderful wines. Um, they tend to be higher in alcohol and in my opinion, um, probably not as well suited for food. but. Uh, most of, uh, of Americans uh, use uh, wine, uh, consume wine as, as a cocktail substitute. They like it by itself. And California makes big saturated uh, wines that are very good for that. France has a long, long tradition, a 2,000 year tradition of making wine for the table. And I have to say my own prejudice for table wine is uh, uh, French wine. Well, on that note, we are going to have to go to the break. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about the differential in price. Why do some bottles of wine cost only $20 and others maybe $500? We'll discuss that. Stay tuned. If you're buzzed and doing this, to make yourself feel OK to drive, CWX. Ah. You're not okay to drive. Y G K L V W. Uh, regular U. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Randy Kemner. We're talking about wine. Randy, before the break, we were talking about uh, the difference between French wine and California wine and all the various regions, the growing regions in California. But now let's talk about the tasting process because we know that a connoisseur of fine wine is someone who really knows his or her stuff about the wine they're drinking. So what is the difference between a true wine connoisseur and someone who's just a wine enthusiast? What do the connoisseurs know that we don't know? I'll give you my opinion, and this is my take on this, um, and, and you'll find people that will argue uh, the point, but to me a connoisseur is someone knowledgeable enough in wine to know what wine is appropriate for the occasion. Uh, 
and it doesn't have to be the most expensive wine all the time, uh, and quite often it isn't. Quite often the best wine is a, uh, a $15 Beaujolais or a $25 Vouvray uh, or a light uh, Albarino from, uh, from Spain, uh, and none of which are going to cost you a lot of money. Um, uh, having the experience to know what goes with what food, uh, what, what has been successful with what food, to me that's connoisseur, connoisseurship, kind of like you would think of an Epicurean. Now, wine enthusiasts are people who just love wine, uh, but there can be a wine enthusiast that all they know is Napa Valley, or all they know is uh, Santa Inez Valley, or all they know is Chardonnay, and they know every single thing about every single Chardonnay, but they may not know any context. Uh, they just l know that they love the taste of these things. Uh, so uh, to me, the term wine enthusiast is a general term that we all fall under. Uh, people that, that enjoy wine and, and maybe enjoy it enough to go visit a winery now and then. But a, but a connoisseur to me is, is someone uh, who has a little more experience in dealing with um, wine uh, for, the, for the, the proper wine for the proper occasion. So I, I gather then that the connoisseur would, would know a lot about different varieties of wine, also a little bit of context of the, maybe the history of the growing region and things of that nature? It helps, sure. Um, I didn't really uh, understand, um, fully understand a lot of European wines until I went there. And uh, in my professional capacity, I was very fortunate to be able to uh, break bread with people in their own homes. Uh, for example, in Provence, uh, eating Provençal food with uh, Provençal wine. In uh, Tuscany, drinking Tuscan wine with Tuscan food. Um, in Piedmont, uh, having some traditional dishes from Piedmont with, uh, with Barbera and Barolo from the Piedmont. And that really helps and that really goes a long way in, in these aha moments. And there are times, and I've learned a lot from, um, from my customers. Uh, uh, one of the things I didn't realize when I, uh, when I um, built the store was how many great cooks there are <laughs> and great home chefs there are uh, who shop in wine stores. And I, and I uh, became friends with quite a few people who are great home cooks. And they are also enthused about finding right wines for the right foods. And I'll give you one example. Um, uh, I have a, a friend who, who created a Grand Aeoli, which is a, a, a traditional Provencal summer uh, dish with a lot of garlic may mayonnaise, the aioli. And, uh, and it was summertime, we, were, we had lots of rosé uh, from Provence on the table. And uh, I noticed that when I ate this garlicky uh, dressing with the food that was on the table, that when I tasted this rosé, uh, which I enjoyed on its own many times, it completely changed the wine and brought out a fruitiness in the wine that I didn't even know existed. The same thing happens uh, when I'm doing Italian white wines and, and maybe having a panzanella salad with a lot of vinegar and, and tomatoes and, and the, the, the bread salad. And you're eating this and you're drinking these, these white wines that, that are usually a little tight and wiry and all of a sudden they explode with fruit. And then you realize, well, that's why they make these wines this way. Well, Randy, we talked about driving up Highway 101 along the Central Coast and noticing all the vineyards. Well, now we're going to do Wine Education 101. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a series of, of rapid fire questions here. These are things that people want to know that have always wondered about. And so we'll start with a question that I teased at the break or before the break, and that is 
the differential in price. Why do some wines that taste really good only cost $25, yet in the same store you'll see wines under lock and key that are selling for $450 or $500? What justifies that difference in price? Well, there are, let, let's just go to Economics 101. Uh, we're talking about market forces, uh, supply and demand. Uh, if a winery over the, over the decades has established uh, a, a great reputation for their wine and they make only so much, so many bottles, and if the whole world wants that wine, uh, the price is going to go up. Uh, we find that now um, the first, what they call the first growths of Bordeaux are now over $1,000 a bottle. Um, there are some estates uh, that the new wine from, you know, in Burgundy can be $12,000, $15,000 for a bottle. Um, now, are those, you know, uh, hundreds of times better than, than a really good $20 bottle of wine? Uh, no, they're not. There's no way that they can be. Uh, but given the history of these wines, given the lore of these wines, sometimes there's magic in, in just opening a bottle of, of Chateau Margaux or opening a, you know, a, a reserve wine from, from a California um, Napa Valley producer that you wouldn't normally um, you wouldn't normally consume, but but you try it out, and it's and it's uh, it's always a great experience. Uh, there's there's a mystique there, right? So history and context also play into that, as well as market economics, as you said. Sure, you know, wine is an aspirational pre premium wine is an aspirational beverage. You know, we talk. It can be food to a lot of people. Um, it can be a beverage to a lot of people, but also fine wine is aspirational. What does it mean? It, does it mean that when you have a, uh, a glass of wine, uh, your meal is better, uh, you feel better about yourself? Someday I would like to go in that lock case, you know, with my, my Christmas bonus and, and see what that wine is all about, um, you know, I worked hard, I deserve it, I'd like to do that someday. Uh, uh, that's what that's all about. All right, well, here are the quick rapid fire questions. So I see a date stamped on a bottle of wine. What does that date indicate to me? Is it telling me that that's the year that that wine was bottled, or is that the year that the grapes utilized in the bottling were harvested? When you see a vintage date, that's the date that the grapes were harvested. They can be in barrel for a year or two or five, and in some cases even longer, like in port, and then bottled later. But if it's a vintage date, that means that they were, the grapes were harvested that year. Okay, next question is, when the experts say no wine before it's time, I think that was Orson Welles on the Gallo yep. commercials who said that, or, you know, wine gets better with age. Well, what does that mean, wine gets better with age? What's the theory behind that principle? Well, it, traditionally, a lot of wine was a uh, coarse when it would come out, and it would require uh, age in the cellar to soften the tannins and make it a more palatable, more complex wine for the table. Um, Bordeaux, Port, uh, Barolo, these, these traditional great wines uh, would require 20 years in the cellar. The big uh, gorilla in the room here is uh, the fact that global warming is changing all of that. And so um, some wines will improve in the cellar in a shorter time, but now most wine is made to be consumed uh, early because they lack the natural acidity to be able to age the way they, they used to. So we're in, a, we're in a brave new world here and, and uh, nobody is certain about uh, what's gonna go on with that. The one thing we do know, if you're gonna store wine, keep it at 55 degrees. So keep it cool. Yeah. All right, so what about the rules about wine? You can only, re you can only have 
red meat with red wine and you can only have white wine with fish and seafood and so on. Do those rules apply all the time or is there a lot of flexibility now depending upon what type of wine we're talking about? Well, those are traditional jumping off points and, um, and they're not laws. You're not going <laughs> to go to wine jail for, uh, for having red wine with fish. Um, but generally, uh, lighter foods, you want to pair with uh, lighter wines. Uh, heavier foods with heavier wines. Complex wines with simpler foods. Simpler wines with more complex foods. And so uh, uh, th those are, are kind of my guidelines, um, but uh, with uh, wine pairing. We just have a couple minutes left, uh, so we'll go rapid fire on these. Uh, sparkling okay. wine, which is, some people call it the bubbly, which is known as Champagne, but Champagne is the name of a region in France. So, and there's different names for different countries. Spumante is the name in Italy they mm -hmm. use for sparkling wine. Here in California, we have sparkling wine too. Some of it is called Champagne, but there's been some controversy about naming. So briefly, what was the controversy about naming things Champagne? Champagne is rightly the most famous sparkling wine region in the world. They have a special soil. They have a, a, they can only use three grapes, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, to make a, a, a fine champagne uh, primarily. And uh, because it was so famous and so dominant, uh, sparkling wine producers in California and in New York, uh, they didn't know how to describe what they were doing, so they put champagne on the label. They would say New York champagne or or California, uh, California Champagne. But really, uh, the people in Champagne hate that because it's a protected region where you, only the best grapes can be grown there. And we can put Thompson seedless grapes in Andre Champagne and still call it Andre. Now we signed a treaty some years back, not too many years back, we signed a treaty respecting the place names in Europe, but with a caveat that uh, there are a handful of wineries that are grandfathered in. So we can have a California Port and a California Burgundy and a California Chablis and all these great uh, place names and we can have California uh, Champagne but only those wineries that were making it before the treaty, those after the treaty are prohibited from doing that. Well, thanks, Randy. This has really been a nice conversation, informative as well as fun. So thank you for joining us today. Sure, it's been my uh, joy and pleasure to uh, talk to you, Dave. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.